All right, as I said, I want to, you know, very, very quickly uh, deal with this issue of uh, the silence of women, uh, the proposals that have been made as far as how we interpret uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 33b through 36, and uh, at this point really cut off any kind of extended discussion because we're going to come back to the issue of a woman's role within both worship and uh, within the leadership of the church when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I promise you I'll take a whole break of 10 minutes and interact with you at that point uh, on uh, the issue of women um, so as not to, again, um, you know, stop what, uh, you know, we're doing as far as uh, the video is concerned. But the, uh, the silence of women, to take a look at the context, uh, Paul states he, he is here dealing with what takes place within public worship. Uh, verse uh, 26, when you assemble. So he's talking about the church assembling together uh, to... Uh, to worship the Lord, to, uh, uh, to hear the, the teaching of God's word and uh, the, the public response uh, that takes place. And probably, as uh, most exegetes, to see the last statement of verse 33 introducing 34 to 36, as in all the churches of the saints. So what Paul is going to say here about women and uh, women's responsibility within the church assembled as it comes together and particularly within uh, the context to worship the Lord, to remember Jesus and the breaking of the bread, the drinking of the cup. And as that was used as a time also for instruction within Scripture, Acts chapter 20, within the early Gentile churches. And what Paul is saying is, I give this instruction, this is instruction that is followed in all churches. That's important because he is not dealing at this point just with a cultural expression in Corinth. He is uh, speaking of that which uh, was to be the practice in all the churches of the saints. That is, let the women keep silent in the churches. And within that context, the, in all of the churches that are gathered for this public expression of worship, the public assembly. For they are not permitted to speak. But let them subject themselves just as the law also says. Debate upon whether that is the Old Testament law. Or law in the sense of the tradition that was then followed within the, uh, the synagogues. And within the Jewish public expression of, uh, of worship. It doesn't seem to be any kind of a public law. Although, you know, women were you know, uh, certainly restricted from uh, certain activities as far as the Roman law is concerned. So is he dealing here with the Old Testament? Is he dealing here with the Mosaic Commandments? Is he dealing with the practice that was taking place within Judaism? Is he talking about law as some kind of Roman legal precedent here? You can see how, you know, exegetes uh, can wrestle with that issue. But in the end, uh, at the end of the day, that really doesn't change what he has just said. They're not permitted to speak, but let them subject themselves. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you only the word of God went forth, or has it come only to you? Are you the only ones who have, have given forth the word? Are you the only ones who received the word? Uh, don't you have to follow in this as in other uh, practices in your public assembly? Don't you have to follow the understanding of uh, the word 
as it is understood in other churches as well. And uh, so he is, uh, he is bringing up a very important principle here that when a church starts to go its own way and understand Scripture in a way, the Word of God in a way, and he's talking now not so much about the written Word at this point as the Word of God that has come to the, uh, to the apostolic church, all right, do you, uh, do you go your own way, your own understanding? Or uh, do you recognize that there are other churches to which that word has come to and, uh, and listen to what uh, they have said about interpretation and practice as well? But what does he mean here? All right, I want, well, I don't want, that's going to be First Timothy. For they are not permitted to speak. All right, what is the silence of women here? And how does this particularly tie in to 11.5? That is also speaking about the uh, traditions and seems to assume that it's when the congregation comes together. And in verse 5, with every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head for she is one and the same with her whose head is shaved. All right, but notice her head uncovered while praying or prophesying. Doesn't praying and prophesying by its very nature mean that she is speaking? So what does it mean to pray or prophesy with the proper... Uh, the proper head coming. Well, the liberals are very quick to say it's an out-and-out contradiction. Paul in chapter 11 is saying they can speak with certain restraints. In chapter 14, he is saying they can't speak. Paul can't even remember from, you know, five minutes ago what he dictated to now. It, it's an out-and-out Contradiction. This is all part of Paul's flow of consciousness. He just says whatever pops into his mind and whatever principle might deal with the situation he is dealing with at that point. Just a lack of consistency on the part of Paul. Obviously, no evangelical can go along with that. But what do we do? Well, there certainly on the surface seems to be a contradiction. And so with Fee, they say it's a textual gloss. Now, this is not a textual variant. There's absolutely no text which removes these verses from the text or puts them someplace else. All, uh, all Fee is saying is, is, okay, this was very, very early in the tradition, so it's not found within our text, but Paul didn't originally write this. That was a scribal edition later to try to explain what Paul was saying by principle before and after and how it might apply to the situation of women within the church. So it's very simple. It's, it does contradict chapter 11, verse 5, but it's not a Pauline contradiction. It's a scribal contradiction. Well, this is, uh, this is pretty hard to take when you've got absolutely no text. I mean, this, this, is, this is subjectivism of the highest degree again. It wasn't from Paul because Paul couldn't have written it. Well, Paul did. And, uh, and there's absolutely no text that would bring this into, into question. And if we believe in the providence of God, that God has, has brought the text to us, or at least reflected the text within the variance that he has allowed to come to us, so we are to practice, you know, God-directed textual criticism. Um, certainly we have to say, well, this is part of the text. So how do we to, to understand it? Well, as we said, beginning in verse 26, Paul has spoken in chapter 14 about the, the assembly. Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. What he's saying is, okay, all individuals based upon 
You know, the gift that God has given to them can have, if we might put it this way, ministry if function that, that could take place within the public assembly. But let all things be done for edification. Right? Just because one has certain, uh, has certain uh, ministry laid upon their heart by God, as far as, uh, as far as a psalm, that is a way to express praise to God, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, its interpretation. Everyone does not have a right to give expression to that within the public assembly. Rather, everything is to be done for edification. Everything has to be done for the well-being of the assembly. And that means in verse 40, everything has to be done properly and in order. There are certain guidelines to take. And this would be my understanding going back to chapter 11. Even though a woman might come to an assembly, you know, and have a prayer or prophecy, she is to show subjection to her head or husband within the public assembly by, by wearing the, uh, or, or ex exhibiting the outward show of that submission. And you notice I haven't put that down as an interpretive issue because I'm not sure what the answer to that one is. I could certainly lay all the options out for you again. But, uh, but now that there's necessarily a public expression. But in fact, all who have the gift of prophecy, all who have the gift of tongues is what he brings up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, by two or three. We already talked that, interpretation of prophets, two or three. Revelation is made to another city, and let the first keep silence. So verse 31, you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Any exercise of, of God-given Ministry ability is to be exercised within very, very strict restraints within the public uh, uh, assembly. And I think this is where the, you know, the answer, you know, lies here. Now, some bring up, well, the woman can't speak unless it's disruptive speech. Can't be a free fall. They got to speak in, in orders. So when he says they're not permitted to speak, what he means by that is they're not permitted to all speak at once. It's to women. All right, don't all take off. You can speak as long as it's within an orderly progression. But he doesn't say not permitted to, to speak in a disorderly fashion. He's not permitted to, to speak. It can be within the discerning of, of prophecy or criticism of the prophets. Within this, this context, okay, you prophesy and God lays upon your heart that you want to prophesy as well. In other words, uh, a revelation is given to you while seated. All right, this is not a place. You're to keep silent. Not The first one then is to be silent so the second one can speak. It's within this context. It is within the speaking of tongues. All right, anyone can speak in tongues except for the women. They're to remain silent. It is, and Dr. Thomas takes this position, it is the definitive teaching. This is what takes place in all the churches. What Paul was trying to do in chapter 11 is it was such a free-for-all at Corinth, he's just looking for a limited regulation to start to bring their practice in line with uh, the definitive teaching. Or teaching in the assembly is seen in chapter 14. Prophecy outside the assembly is what is being referred to in 11.5. So that uh, a woman is free. In other words, that they would say, okay, the, the, the 
the uh, context is not the public worship in chapter 11. But it is in some other, in uh, some other context uh, where believers are meeting together. Now, in 11.17, he does say, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worst. All right, is that instruction looking ahead to what he's going to say about the Lord's Supper? Or is the transition also includes what he had just said about uh, what was taking place and the need for head covering within the assembly? Or is, and Bible Knowledge Commentary takes this way, David Lowry, distinction between women and wives. That is, the women here who are not permitted to speak are those in verse 35 who can ask their own husbands at home. A wife is to show the sign of authority. A wife is to, is to show, is to, to stay silent. But there are other women who may be able to prophesy and pray. So they can. And so even taking this to the to the level, to, to, to the application of as long as the husband isn't present. In other words, as long as I'm in submission, my husband, my husband is not present, then I have the, the right to, uh, to speak. But if my husband is present, I'm to remain silent. Well, I would, uh, I would lean with all these great exegetical minds taking all of these different positions, ruling out one and two, those aren't great exegetical minds. All right, three through eight, at great godly exegetical minds. I would see both 11 and 14 and speaking about the public assembly. I would see the, the prophecy or prayer going back to, uh, to then 14.26, as being the fact that any believer who comes to worship, all right, based upon uh, the, uh, the giftedness that God has given to them and uh, what they, uh, and how they've grown within that giftedness, what, uh, what insight, what uh, instruction God has given to them, you know, it comes, I think we have to realize, okay, uh, you know, you might be sitting in Sunday morning you know, in a public assembly, hearing God's word, preparing your heart for the, for the breaking of the bread, the, uh, uh, the eating of the bread, the drinking of the cup. And it could be that, all right, the woman next to you, if I can put it this way, is, is studied up and prayed up a whole lot better than you are. In fact, she might be studied up and prayed up, hopefully not, but then the person who is Speaking, preaching, sad to say in some churches that today could be a reality, all right? But nevertheless, she is to realize, all right, I'm to exercise submission. And even though I might, all right, it's not a matter of ability or giftedness. It's a matter of the fact that, all right, just like even many men within the context who also might have a tongue or the interpretation thereof or a teaching or a prophecy, they also, if it is not the proper time and a proper way to exercise that giftedness also beforehand, are told to do what? All. Be silent. Be subject to what God is doing. And the particular application of this to women is all right, so, so God has given you a prayer. God has given you a, a prophetic word, which in this context is a, a thus saith the Lord uh, from, uh, from Scripture that can be applied within this context. You don't have a right to say it within this environment. Because in that environment, a woman is to be silent. Now, she can certainly give voice 
at the time when the congregation as a whole gives voice. It's not a, a complete and total silence. That if all of the congregation is led to sing, she can do what? Sing. If all the congregation is laid to pray and ask for a response of amen, so be it, she also can respond. But she does not lead, and uh, particularly within the service, uh, if teaching is taking place that she would like to learn and pursue further, verse 35, it is not her role, nor even the role of the husband. To break into the speaker and say, whoa, 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 give me a further explanation. What are you saying there? All he's saying at this point is, is look, her, her further instruction is going to come from her husband and her husband where? At home. It's improper for her to speak in that kind of a leadership role within the church. And we'll come back and talk about that that uh, leadership role again in First uh, Timothy where Paul is going to reiterate this, uh, this basic teaching for all the churches as is uh, reflected here in, uh, in First Corinthians chapter 14. But it's important for you to know the extensive way in which this has been taken uh, because I said on, on Friday of the extensive discussion that is enjoined today about women in ministry. Let's move on. Uh, preaching 1 Corinthians. Do so. Uh, and I think uh, preaching 1 Corinthians within a context of, as we've looked at it within this course of Paul's total ministry of the Corinthians, I think is uh, very, very valuable and uh, very, very vital. Well, quickly to introduce ourselves to, to 2 Corinthians. As we go through the letter, uh, Paul certainly, and all we can, can pick up is he, he is making certain points about his ministry. He is making certain affirmations about his interaction with the Corinthians. Now, we cannot prove this, but it would seem as he, as he makes certain statements, he is making these statements in, in light of, of attacks that have been made against his ministry and against his, his character. And so basically, if we might put it this way, from his affirmations... We, uh, we have delineated what we believe are 10 attacks that might not have all arisen from the same quarter, from the same individuals within the church, but certainly together is uh, what Paul is, is writing and defending himself as he, uh, as he interacts with the Corinthian church as a whole. Uh, some were saying he was vacillating. Uh, the, uh, the fact that he stated certain plans to the Corinthians and then did not follow through on those plans. In this confidence, I intended to first come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. As I left Ephesus, to begin in Achaia, go through Macedonia and back to Achaia and then on to Judea. Therefore, verse 17, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? That was my plan. Or that which I propose, purpose, do I purpose according to flesh? So with me there should be yes, yes, no, no at the same time. God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no, that is at the same time. But he's going to go on to, to talk about here 
the, the plans, what have taken place, then what have taken place, the end of chapter 2 and again into chapter 7. Okay, it was that vassalization, same thing in chapter 10. You know, he's, he talks a good talk when he's away from us, but yeah, when he comes here, totally different. I mean, Paul, you, you can't trust what he says. Well, certainly circumstances can come to change his plans. And obviously, uh, depending upon the response, he can uh, certainly uh, speak differently to the, the Corinthians. But this thing, he was, he was vacillating. He was, uh, he was dictatorial. He, he, he wanted to lord it over the, uh, the people. Not that we lord it over your faith. He makes that affirmation. Maybe because some were accusing him of it. He's, he's, uncred, he's uncredentialed. Now, if anyone should recognize his apostolic ministry, it should be the Corinthians. Do we have to start commending ourselves again to you of all people? Uh, but certainly as you get into chapter 10, questions were being brought up on whether he was truly an apostle or not. Or his gospel is obscure. You can't understand it. You know, Paul, bless his soul. It's, you know, by the time he's finished speaking, what was he talking about? Well, he brings up if it's obscure, it's not. It's not because of the of the preacher's problem. It's because of the hearer's problem. For a gospel is veiled, is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. If you can't understand what I'm saying, there's something wrong with you. Now, uh, Paul could say that. Some of us might not be to that point yet. But, uh, you know, Paul can say, I, I preach and I preach clearly. I make Christ known and the problem is in the, in the minds of those who hear if they cannot understand. We preach not ourselves, but Christ as Lord and ourselves as bondservants for the Lord's sake. He sought to destroy and cause pain. He delighted in that. And uh, Paul is certainly going to show his heart here of how much sorrow comes to him when he has to deal and confront the sinfulness of his beloved children. Yeah, this is, this is no more than, you know, children sometimes who think that their parents just take delights in disciplining them. And particularly when a father says, you know, this is hurting me a whole lot more than it hurts you. You know, the old joke, the kids say, well, spank yourself. Yeah, well, no, no, no. You know, you, you, you'll understand when you're finally a father. Well, you got some spoiled children, some sort of spiritual children. A Corinth that uh, thought that Paul was, uh, was delighting in, uh, in the pain that he was causing. He was a coward. Yeah, I might talk a good talk, but backed into a corner... Yeah, he'll become Mr. Milk Toast. He'll back down. Meek when face to face. Bold when absent. It was, it was a coward. He didn't maintain apostolic dignity. <laughs> of all things, he worked with his hands. And had done so in Corinth. And for 18 months had never asked for support from, uh, from the Corinthians. I robbed other churches taking wages to serve you. I accepted gifts more than once from Philippi. But no, I, I never became a burden. Forgive me that wrong. You know, obviously, if an apostle shows up, an apostle is supposed to be supported. And this was being used against him. 
I mean, how can he be an apostle when he worked making tents? He was not, uh, he was not an original apostle. It doesn't go back to Jerusalem. Didn't hear Christ in the flesh. Well, he doesn't collect for himself. They, they go back to when he starts, but now he's collecting an offering. Sly guy. Gives you this idea that he's not interested in money. Then I was asking for money. And he's asking for money for himself. Now, his ruse might be, you know, for those suffering saints in Judea. But in uh, chapter 12, he talks about uh, crafty fellow that I am. I did not burden myself, I did not make a burden of myself. Crafty fellow, I took you in by the seat, thinking he's not concerned with money. Now, once I got you on my side, on my team, now I'm zonking you for this collection. Certainly, I have not taken advantage of you through any of those who have sent you, have I? Well, that is the latest one being Titus, and he's still urging in chapters 8 and 9 for the collection to be, to be taken. I mean, this, Paul, he's never going to get to Jerusalem. Why are these guys coming? It's all for Paul now to, to, get his, yeah, to get his just desserts from you financially. Oh, sneaky fellow that I am. I got you to think I wasn't interested in money. When all along, I was. And he walked after the flesh. Fleshly decisions. Not led by the Spirit of God. And so Paul, obviously, takes pains to defend himself. He hints at it, as I said earlier on within the, uh, the letter. And then certainly in chapter 10, takes his gloves off. And from some of the, some of the most brutal attacks that were being made upon him, he takes great pains to, to, to answer. And uh, in chapter 11, he even, uh, he even points out he didn't want to do so. He didn't, he didn't want to defend himself, but he had to do so. So he can uh, say in 11.16, again, I say, let no one think me foolish, but if you do, receive, receive me as foolish that I may boast a little. That which I'm speaking, I'm not speaking as the Lord would, but it is in foolishness and confidence of boasting. Since, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. They're bringing up what God has done for them. So let me boast of what God has done through me and, uh, and, and bear, you know, with me. But in the end, instead of talking, as he gets in chapter 12, instead of, of talking about the things that God has allowed me to do, let me, let me talk about my weaknesses. And then when it's all over in 12, 11, I become foolish. You yourselves compel me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody who God is allowed to be a somebody in his service, but really, even with all my service, I'm still a nobody. That's, that's basically what Paul has said in chapters 11 and 12. I'm a nobody, but I'll boast about being a somebody, because you forced me to, but I'm really a nobody, and you compel me. You made me have to talk this way because of, uh, because of what you've allowed and are still allowing to be said about me in your midst. 
He characterizes his opponents, okay? Between 1st and 2nd Corinthians, all right, if I become your enemy by telling you the right thing in 1st Corinthians, I become your enemy by confronting you concerning your sin. But we get in 2nd Corinthians, and, and where the things are changed, and now Paul is really zeroing in and saying, you know, this opposition is coming from a very organized source. Someone in your midst who seems to have come from outside is poisoning your mind against me. Against what we've already seen in Romans and we talked about in 1 Corinthians. That's the problem with division. Division can become the avenue of out and out attack. You know, it starts off, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollo, Cephas, etc. And all of a sudden, you know, when there starts to be that kind of division over Paul, then the church is opened up for those who want to destroy the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And he refers to them as both false apostles and super apostles. What the New American translates as most eminent apostles. I am not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. Now, Paul, I think at this point, is using their, either their terminology for themselves or is coined a term. So they're bringing up how great they are compared to us other slimy apostles. Oh, they're the eminent ones. They're, you know, they're the ones who have it all together and have the right message supposedly from Jesus Christ and from the church in Jerusalem. Or again in, in 12, 11, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. And he says that in this respect, I was not inferior, 12, 11, to the most eminent apostles, even though I'm nobody. Go back to when I was with you. And uh, the, the validating signs that were done by the Lord through me to validate my ministry measure up to any apostolic miracle that any so-called apostle has ever done or has stated that they have done. And he refers to them not just as these eminent or pseudo, I'm sorry, as uh, uh, super apostles, but also as pseudo apostles. They claim to be apostles, but they're not. 11.13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. The claim is they're apostles from Christ. The real truth in verse 14 is they're emissaries of Satan. For even Satan disguises himself. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. And Paul leaves us in no doubt that these men who claim to be apostles, to be even eminent and superior apostles to all the rest, in the end, are no apostles at all. They're emissaries of Satan servants of, of his. And at that point, you almost say, Paul, well, tell us what you really think about these men. I mean, he just he categorizes them. And these are the, the men that the Corinthians then had allowed to poison their minds. And uh, that poison was, continually, was continuing to be spewed within the Corinthian church, even as Paul writes this letter. And we'll come back to that because that's what will help us to appreciate, you know, how the unity of the letter is to be seen. 
I will uh, I'll just let you uh, trace this trace this through. I've given you the uh, the verses, but uh, Paul, even in the midst of all of this attack, talks about the surpassing glory of the ministry that Jesus had given to him. And uh, what a great stewardship and and the grace and how he was unworthy of uh, of what uh, uh, Christ was was allowing him to to experience. And even though he's going through tremendous uh, heartache in his dealing with the Corinthians, that uh, nevertheless he still gloried in the ministry that uh, Christ had given to him. And we'll. We'll see this in this uh, center section of the first part of the body as we take a look at the structure. He talks a lot about his affliction and weakness. God had brought him to the very point of death. He despaired of life itself. And his weakness, a God-engendered weakness, and we'll talk about that with the thorn in the flesh in just a second. But how God had comforted him in his affliction and strengthened him in his weakness. To the end that then he could be an avenue of comfort and strength to others, but particularly comfort. He went through this so he would know how to better comfort others within their affliction. And it's very interesting in, in this letter where he talks about these false apostles as being servants or emissaries of Satan. It's in 2 Corinthians. He speaks more of Satan than any of his other letters. He is well aware of the existence of Satan and his tactics. And uh, we'll refer to him in a number of ways. The God of this world, Baal. Satan, the, uh, the deceiver, as uh, you go through this, uh, uh, through this letter. Now, obviously, he doesn't, he doesn't give us great extended discussions of Satan. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not given to the Corinthians a Satanology complete and total within this letter. But it's interesting that he sees behind what is taking place, the hand of Satan in his interaction with the Corinthian church. So the purpose, and this is uh, agreed upon by exegetes, he defended, Paul defended his apostolic authority and ministry against a pointed attack from his foes at Corinth. And uh, we will tie in the structure to the first interpretive issue, so let me just make a quick statement uh, about uh, the bibliography. And uh, then we'll take a break and come back and uh, talk about the interpretive uh, uh, issues. But uh, uh, a number of, of good works are available today on 2 Corinthians. I give you Martin in the Word Biblical Commentary series, not because, again, I agree with every one of his conclusions. But he has given a most thorough uh, exegetical discussion as with all good exegetes, he, uh, he uh, will go over past exegetical works and solutions and uh, give you the pros and the cons of the different positions that have been, uh, have been brought forth and, uh, and uh, packs more punch per page, you know, uh, than, uh, than any other commentary exegetically at uh, this point. I would, though, for interpretive purposes, point you to the two English commentaries uh, by Paul Barnett in the NIC and uh, David Garland in the NAC that are good discussions and, uh, and in the end, I think, come to better exege exegetical conclusions. And uh, then expositionally, Dr. MacArthur's... Uh, uh, work on 2 Corinthians and the new work by Scott Hafeman in the NAVAC. Uh, again, a good interaction with contemporary 
exegetical works and uh, uh, pretty good indication of where application might lie in, in uh, some of the uh, situations the pastors will face today as they have to preach uh, this book. All right, now to 2 Corinthians and the interpretive issues. And the major issue of the letter is number one. I hope you weren't so quickly reading 2 Corinthians that you didn't, uh, didn't sense at least a little disconnect between the first nine chapters and the last four chapters. The, the tone of the first nine chapters is a tone of struggle that has been resolved. So that uh, uh, chapter 7 verse 6, but God who comes to the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. In verse 13, and besides our comfort, we rejoice even more for the joy of Titus. Because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. all right, so here is Paul writing and he's, he, he's certainly looked back over his relationship with the Corinthians. And even his, his uh, a fairly recent relationship with the Corinthians and the hardship that... Uh, has been there, but now, as he is writing, things have been resolved. And there has now been an, an openness, an embrace of the Apostle Paul that Paul is rejoicing in. And even more is rejoicing for the joy of Titus whose spirit has been refreshed by you all. Yeah, here was Titus as, you know, as uh, my representative, knowing what was taking place, you know, between me and ye. And, uh, you know, not too excited to go to, to Corinth and have to deal with what's taking place there. And look what's taking place. You've responded. You've embraced us. Reconciliation has occurred. And so there's almost a sense as he's looking back over the, you know, the heartbreak and the struggle. It is with a sense of relief and a sense of rejoicing that has come to a conclusion. And on that basis, he renews his appeal in chapters 8 and chapter 9 uh, to them to complete the, uh, the collection for the saints in Jerusalem before he, he comes to Corinth himself. And even here, even though he is, he is instructing and exhorting, you know, there, there is a sense in which even as I'm challenging you, there's an underlying uh, ex expectation that they are going to respond and it's like you're not prepared for the change of tone that takes place in chapter 10. Now let me deal with those super apostles. Let me deal with those who have not and probably will not be reconciled to me. Let me take them on. Because certainly, as uh, Paul is speaking, they are still in the midst of these Corinthians, as I've brought up on a couple of occasions now in the previous uh, hour, that uh, they are still influencing some, and by their very existence, if not dealt with, the whole situation could blow up again. I mean, how fickle are the Corinthians? All right, yeah, so you've embraced me now. If, if these are allowed to remain and continue to have their organized attack against me, when, when, 
when might this present reconciliation blow up all over again? And he certainly wants to deal with even them because of this potential before he gets to his uh, final third visit with the, with the Corinthians. Well, to some of our liberal brethren, it's impossible that uh, Paul could have written this two-faced kind of letter at uh, the same time and dispatched it at, with the same uh, mailman to get to the Corinthians and have it read at the same time to the Corinthians. So that uh, chapter uh, 10 to, to 13 has to be another letter. Now, they don't necessarily deny the fact that it's Pauline. They go back to chapter 2 with the severe letter. Uh, this, uh, the, the letter that has uh, brought and caused sorrow and uh, reconciliation on the, uh, the part of this individual that implicitly seems to have taken his stand against the Apostle Paul. Uh, for he uh, says in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, if, verse 5, if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree in order not to say too much to you all. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so now you should forgive him. He has uh, forgiven him. And uh, the church now needs to forgive him as Paul has, has uh, forgiven him. It seems to, to intimate, all right, he's caused sorrow not to me. Well, that's what it seems like on the surface, but much more to, to each one of you. Because he has, he has been this individual who has opposed me, but now he has... You know, he has uh, repented, and uh, I am willing to forgive, and you should be willing to forgive as well. And so he has written a, a severe letter for the majority to take this man to task for his response to the Apostle Paul. He has done so. They have done so. He has repented. Now it is time for forgiveness. Now, that, by those who take this to be the severe letter, is, okay, he is the ringleader opposite against Paul. He was one of these false prophets. He was one of these uh, pseudo-apostles, but uh, he has fallen in with them, uh, arose within the, the Corinthians himself and kind of became their spokesman. And now he has uh, backed off. And uh, so, the, uh, uh, and so the severe letter is, is, is what the Lord has used to bring about uh, the Corinthians dealing with these opponents, this, this opponent, these opponents of Paul that has uh, brought about this repentance and rec reconciliation and now need for, uh, uh, for forgiveness on the part of the Corinthians. So that when you read, beginning in chapter 10 through the end of chapter 13, you are reading the severe letter that Paul made reference to to back in chapter 2, verse 4, that has created this response uh, in, in Corinth. Martin won't go so far as to say it is the severe letter, but he certainly says, well, at this point, another letter from the Apostle Paul in the textual tradition has been spliced into the letter that was written to Corinth on this occasion. It is a separate letter. So as you read 2 Corinthians, you're really reading two letters that have been blended together. Letter A, with, uh, with the beginning of the body and 112 through chapter 9, verse 15, blended together with letter B, 10, 1 to 13, 10, with a salutate, with a, with a prologue, an epilogue, that probably come from the letter that Paul was writing on this historical occasion. The problem, of course, is we have no textual evidence 
that two letters have been spliced together into one to make up our present Second Corinthians. A third position, and, and uh, Dr. MacArthur doesn't say this is what happened, but uh, speaks in the study notes as a possibility of what happened, is that Paul is dictating his letter, and lo and behold, just as he finishes dictating chapter 9, he receives word that all is not well after all, that the first nine chapters are his response to Titus's report. And as he is dictating and before the letter is sent, he receives word that things have blown up again. And so from a second report of what had taken place, he writes again. Or there is a time period between when he finished dictating the first nine chapters and the letter had not yet been sent. He gets the further word and he says, rip up the conclusion, I got more to say. That's the basic understanding of, of position three. That is all one letter, but it's a resumed letter. Now, of course, the problem is we, we have no evidence. We don't have video today of how Paul dictated letters on how he might dictate a letter, take some time before he actually sent it. Uh, I've finished. Uh, let, let's, let's sit on it for a week and uh, come back, you know, come back in about a week tactic. Just read it back to me. See if I still feel the same way. Then if I do, we'll let it go. And we have no idea of how the, uh, the, the letters that we have from Paul, you know, were, were composed. But... We do know that once a letter was sent, it was, writ it was read to the assembly as a total letter. You would think if there was some kind of a time lapse and Paul now was responding to a second report when you get to chapters 10 and following, there'd be some hint within the letter that says to the recipients, by the way, I've got a further report. He certainly has done that in 1 Corinthians. As he's dealt with the reports he's talked about, it's been reported to me. Chloe's people have said this. It's been reported to me, chapter, you know, chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 1, about what is taking place. Yeah, he, he certainly, in his dealing with the Corinthians, has said in the first letter exactly where the information has come from to which he is responding. And he has admitted, had done the same in 2 Corinthians. I'm responding to the report, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I received from Titus. Titus has come. Titus has reported what has taken place. And so you'd think if he'd gotten some other report, from somebody else from Titus, or Titus has said something else, you would think that at least there'd be some kind of intimation of that in the last four chapters. There isn't. Which leads me away from any of the first three positions to position four. This is a unified letter. Paul received the report from Titus and dictates, and I'm not going to say he dictated it within an hour, or he dictated it within a day. I don't know how long he dictated it. But it's all in response to Titus's report on what had now transpired in Corinth. And as you hear the letter, there is no hint that this is other than a unified letter. All right, now you come to the structure. It has a prologue. Paul identifying himself and Timothy to the church which is in Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. So it's to the church in Corinth particularly. 
but it was also to be read in the other churches throughout the province of Achaia as well. And you would think, well, why didn't he bring up a thanksgiving for the Corinthians' reconciliation? I was going to do that in chapter 7. But at this point, he moves from the salutation into his doxology because what behind all that had taken place was thanksgiving to God for what he had done. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who comforts us in all our affliction so we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. But rather than just at this point talking about how in my prayers I give thanks for you, let me just give you an insight into my thanksgiving, my doxology, my, my praise to God for what God has accomplished in my life through the experience of affliction that he has allowed to come into my life. Realizing you, Corinthians, as well as others, have been afflicted too and how God can use what I have learned for your profit as well and how God has delivered me. So with the circumstances taking place, the fact that Paul here gives a doxology instead of a thanksgiving, can clearly be, be reconciled with the situation as we read through the letter. And then the body. As Paul explains and defends his apostolic ministry. Now in light, as we said, of what he had passed on concerning his plans, he does speak and explain his conduct to them. He recounts his past actions toward them. And how, yes, his original plan was to come to Corinth first, but then the sorrowful visit, he didn't want to come back to, to Corinth immediately. That is why he has gone to Macedonia as he's left Ephesus first instead. There, there, there is a reason. And the fact of how he calls them is he to forgive and restore the, uh, the, uh, the now repentant offender. And how as he went and left Ephesus, he came to Troas in, in 2.12, and there was a door open. He had an opportunity to, to proclaim the gospel. But Titus was supposed to meet him here, and Titus wasn't there. And, uh, so Paul was not even able to take the opportunity. He had to press on because he was more concerned about what was taking place in Corinth and, and what their response had been to even the opportunity that was available to him in Troas. And it's very, very true that he talks about not finding Titus. I took my leave and went to Macedonia. And like you can, uh, you can get a break, as you uh, can see all the way through 7.4, because 7.5 picks up then the, the travel log, if I might say it again. He's, he's explaining what, what has taken place in his dealings with the Corinthians and in 7.5, but even when we came to Macedonia. And that goes all the way back to 2.13. I went on to Macedonia. All right, now I come to Macedonia. Titus has come. He's come to us. Told me what has taken place, and, and I rejoice. And, and we've got this, this lengthy description of Paul's apostolic ministry in 2.14 to 7.4. He has just spoken in 2, 12, and 13 of what we, might, uh, what, what we might call the anxiety, the hardship, the suffering that was involved in his ministry because of his interaction with the Corinthians. But it's very interesting that he says, I went on to Macedonia 
just reading that, I found no rest, took leave, went on. It's like you're a defeated minister of Jesus Christ. You're a defeated apostle. And Paul takes that occasion to break in and say, all right, let me, let me cut the travel log for a few minutes. And let me talk to you about the ministry that God has given to me. It is not a ministry of defeat. It is not just a ministry of sorrow, of discouragement, of heartache. It's not in the end a ministry that I want to throw in the towel and say, God, get yourself another apostle. Even though you Corinthians have tested me. But thanks be to God. You see, it's just like the doxology that began the letter. Behind the human events is the hand of God. And thanks goes to him. You always leads us in triumph. We're, we're, we're a, a fragrant aroma. Those are being saved. They respond. Those, those to death don't. Yeah, again, we don't peddle the word of God. We're not in this just for financial profit, for, for human popularity. We are sincere. We, we speak as, uh, as those who have been raised up by Christ. That is, our, that is our motivation to honor Christ. And, 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 and God has given us a great and superior ministry, a ministry of the new covenant, not, not a ministry that's fading like Moses experienced in the wilderness, but, but a ministry that would only, that would only increase. And if it doesn't increase for one to six, it's, it's because those who don't respond are perishing. And going back to where he ends uh, chapter two. And those who don't respond to, to, to the ministry that, that God has given to us are those who are still part of Satan's domain. And yet, even though the the ultimate result of my ministry is triumph. That doesn't mean I don't go through suffering. And so he turns in 4.7 to, to the fact we have this treasure, the gospel ministry in earthen vessels. For the surpassing greatness of the power of God, the power may be from God and not from ourselves. We, we go through suffering. We're decaying. We're We are declining, but the glory is seen in the message itself. And, and ultimately, our human earthly decay, bodily decay, is going to end up in, in standing before the bema of Jesus Christ and uh, receiving a reward for what he's allowed us to accomplish in our ministry. So the function of his, his, his ministry, knowing that ultimately you stand before the Lord, he fears God. Our ministry is one of persuading, persuading men to be reconciled to Christ. And uh, probably not just 